Okay, I think we're about ready to go ahead and get started with the last session of the day on extreme weather conditions. I looked outside and I didn't see any, so I'm hoping we can generate some here inside. Uh, for this last session, Aidan Tui of EPRI is going to chair, and we got three great uh, talks coming up. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Aidan and let us get started. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So as Charlie said, we've uh, three great speakers here um, in the all in the room, actually. So um, it would be good that we can all hear each other and talk to each other in person. Um, yeah, so, so extreme weather is obviously has come up quite a bit the last few days um, and is a, is a key issue, key concern come, going forward. So I'm going to talk about it from kind of three different perspectives. Josh will start us off and then uh, Justin Sharp and then um, and Richard Tabers. So um, without any further ado, Josh. Great, thanks, Aiden, and thanks everyone for uh, being here today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some recently uh, published work that we did on looking at the evolution of extreme weather events and the operation of the future power system with uh, much greater contribution of variable renewable energy than what we have today. Um, so a, a, a few different motivations uh, and, and objectives that we had here. Uh, primarily, we wanted to take a deeper meteorological uh, analysis look um, at the uh, variable generation resource during um, some past historical weather events that did cause actual impacts to the power system and the, the operations of the power system historically, and then take a, another look at identifying a handful of events that didn't actually cause problems historically when they did occur, but um, uh, potentially might have a, uh, had significant impact on variable renewable energy uh, uh, generation potential over a large temporal and spatial scale, and trying to look at what that means for uh, the operations of the power system. So after we've identified those, we took some, uh, a subset of those events and ran them through a production cost model to look closer at the operations um, and to understand the implications of these events with greater uh, contributions from, from VRE. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see the three different scenarios that we looked at when we were running our production cost model. We looked at a contemporary system that looks a lot like today, about 17% of CONUS uh, annual energy is coming from v VRE in that, in that situation. And then two uh, systems with greater contributions of, of VRE and increases in, in total load, um, one with 50% annual contribution and another with 65% contribution. You can see uh, the, the approximate distribution of, of solar and, and wind that we, we chose in this case. So that I, I should say too, if you're familiar with the North American Renewable Integration Study, that this, these scenarios are, are um, aligned with the low cost uh, 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 renewable energy scenario. Um, uh, so we, we <laughs> looking similar to there, uh, to, to that system. Uh, the bottom right hand corner is just a, uh, uh, something that I want to uh, use as a reference point when we talk about, especially these uh, challenging times when we talk about the, the, uh, the challenges to planning in the high renewable generation system. Um, uh, so on the far right hand, the, the um, middle and the far right hand of those plots look at what is actually providing capacity to our planning reserve during the winter and the summer months. And what we can see is while the, the energy contribution from VRE is quite large, the actual capacity contribution is low. So this is we're, we're, we're anticipating periods where we do need other types of resource to help fill in the gap. So just something to keep in mind as we talk about these uh, challenging periods. Um, a little bit about the data. So uh, we explored uh, uh, events that happened between 2007 through 2013 because uh, our wind toolkit, which is a five minute time resolution to uh, two kilometer by two kilometer spatial resolution is limited to historical weather between 2007 and 2013. And for these uh, particular studies, the time, the time synchronous data between wind, solar load, hydro, is, is quite important. So we're limited there. That's going to be one of the, the key takeaways is I want that to be much larger so that we can uh, look at many more events in the future. Uh, the other piece that was a, um, a significant uh, improvement from past production cost modeling of these future systems is better capturing the weather correlated outages of the thermal fleet. Um, so uh, in, in many of the past studies, uh, we just assume kind of a flat uh, random forage rate, uh, depending on the type of generator. But we know from, uh, from historical data that, that that just isn't true. So we use some trends uh, published by uh, Senator Murphy while he was at uh, Carnegie Mellon um, and, and some of his colleagues uh, looking back at the NERC uh, generator availability database to really better understand the likelihood of an outage from different types of generators at cold and hot temperatures. 
Um, so that was also incorporated in our in our production cost modeling. This is a summary of the types of events that we uh, that we looked at. I'm not going to go into details of each of these events, um, but we uh, uh, focused in on a number of cold and heat waves, winter storms, um, and then uh, the challenges of planning events also tend to be some uh, temperature uh, uh, based events that um, just don't quite look as intense as the cold and heat waves of the extreme weather. So there, there tended to be that, um, uh, so that there is that kind of uh, temperature driven focus in, in across these events. But we have case studies for all of these in our paper. So if you're interested in a particular event, you can certainly go and take a look at those. Um, today, I'm gonna focus in on our cold wave finding in our case study, but I do before I do that, I wanted to just highlight kind of the, some of the key takeaways from the broader study beyond just what uh, uh, the cold wave event. Uh, the first two are related. Um, so uh, the, uh, what we found in our uh, limited data set was that variable generation tends to be available in these newsworthy extreme weather events that uh, occurred in the past. This doesn't mean that everything is rainbows and unicorns and we don't have to worry about uh, future really uh, intense cold waves or heat waves, just that, um, uh, th there'll be similar challenges to what we have today. There'll be similar challenges to uh, operating a system with high contributions from VRE in these cases, but they don't look like cases number two, uh, where we have mild weather that produce extended periods of low wind and solar resource over a broad area. And those are the ones that from a resource adequacy and a future planning perspective, we're really trying to emphasize that, this, that these types of events are what we want to, uh, what we should be um, equally considering in our planning to the, the cases of number one. Um, our finding number three, we'll focus on this uh, more, but the cold wave uh, operations are really driven by wind dynamics. So we'll, we'll dive into that today. Um, operations during heat waves change a lot due to PV, but that's just because it's summer and we're, we're, we're seeing um, uh, high generation potential from those types of resources. But the adequacy periods, those periods after sunset of peak net load, it's really um, uh, the, the, what differentiates between just a normal summer day to a, a tougher summer day uh, from an adequacy perspective is what is the wind doing over a broad, broad area. Um, uh, number five, uh, flexible infrastructure, uh, namely transmission and storage. We focus more on transmission in this particular study since our scenarios didn't have high uh, contributions from storage, but um, uh, some uh, flexible infrastructure can help uh, enable planning for um, uh, geographic diversity. We'll also dive into that a little bit today. And finally, hydro availability and flexibility uh, during these weather events can have a big impact. Okay, so let's dive into the cold wave. Um, so what we're looking at here is the February 2011 cold wave. Uh, we have the temperature on the left hand side and the wind generation potential on the right. Dark blue is really, really good wind resource. Um, so what we, we see during mo all of, most of these cold waves um, is we have the cold mass coming down the front range of the Rocky Mountains and then spreading across the rest of the country and going uh, a f a bringing cold air over a large swath of the eastern and, uh, and Texas interconnections. Um, with that cold, cold front usually comes very, very strong wind resource as it's moving across the country. There's uncertainty though of what happens to the wind generation potential after that front has moved through um, and that cold persists and the load stays high for a period of time. In this particular event, there actually tended to be strong wind resource in some part of the country um, during this uh, period because it was a little bit more of a stronger, uh, more intense cold wave. In our limited data set, it does look like there is a greater uncertainty and, and, and more likelihood of a strong potential of a large uh, spatial lull uh, over uh, a decent of, of a number of days in the more mild cold waves. So let's compare two of the two of those cold waves. On the left hand side, we have the 2011 cold wave, and, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but <clears throat> you might remember the 2011 cold wave is what uh, the uh, winter storm Yuri has draw, drew a lot of um, analogies to. Um, there was uh, utility outages in Texas during that time. Um, Packers also won the Super Bowl that year because uh, yeah. right at about that time. Uh, so uh, anyway, so the, it's pretty intense cold wave that had uh, that had um, impacts at that time. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, we have the 2008 cold wave, uh, which didn't cause any issues at the time, was much more mild, but still kind of had that similar dynamic of front moving through, cold persisting with some increase in load. Uh, so, uh, and then on the bottom, uh, going from the top to the bottom charts here, we're looking at the 2024 systems. So that was about 
uh, annual contribution from wind and solar going down to the 2050 system, which is that 65% uh, much higher contribution from wind and solar. And then just a quick uh, note on the colors um, that I should have gone through. I'd focus in on the purple, which is essentially the gas combined cycle fleet. And then the blue is the wind and the gold is the PV. And right here, we're looking at the, the dispatch for all of the Eastern interconnection uh, on, on aggregate. So if we look at when that initial front comes through, uh, we're seeing periods of time across the Eastern inter interconnection of greater than 80% contribution uh, instantaneously from, from wind and solar. And that's consistent with both of these cold waves, uh, extreme or mild. Um, but as that front moves on and that cold persists and load remains high, these two events diverge. Um, on the, on the left-hand side in our extreme cold wave, wind and solar continue to contribute about 50% of all load during this time. Um, this actually looks quite, uh, quite um, uh, uh, easy to, to operate. We have plenty of capacity and energy resources uh, for, uh, for the system to, to utilize. On the right-hand side, however, um, we've had significant drops in wind generation um, across the eastern interconnection to the point where overnight um, the wind and solar penetration is less than 10% of all generation when it was 80% only a few days earlier. And offline thermal reserves in both MISO and SPP in this case have dropped significantly. So um, that doesn't sound great, but I also want to remind everyone that like, I don't want to be overly alarmist here. This is this is why our winter planning reserve that we showed on slide number two has all of these uh, thermal generator generators contributing to planning reserve. It's because of events like this. Um, so uh, to talk a little bit about the enabling infrastructure to make the, the dispatch that we saw across the Eastern interconnection a reality, um, focusing in on transmission utilization in both cases. Um, so we're, we're, what we're looking at here is the, the uh, net interchange between MISO and its neighbors uh, during, the, during these two events. Highlighted in red is the inter interface between MISO and PJM. So the total interchange between MISO and PJM. And the first thing that you can notice is in both events, um, transmission operation becomes much more dynamic. It becomes larger. It changes directions more quickly in both events. And that's is, um, definitely true in the extreme cold wave, which when we look at the aggregate dispatch looked actually um, uh, uh, that there was plenty of capacity and energy available, but that is enabled by the fact that somewhere in the Eastern interconnection, there was strong wind, even as that cold front had moved through. So I wanna focus in on the 2050 system here a little bit. Um, at the noon hour, sorry, not very good at keeping that stable. Um, the noon hour on February 2nd, um, that's right as that front is about to move through. And, and now we start to get a little bit more uncertainty in where the wind generation is strong. So at that period, MISO was importing seven gigawatts of power from, from PJM. Within a 24 hour period, after that front moves through, uh, load remains high. Um, there actually, uh, a, a second front came through to increase the wind generation in the upper Midwest, causing the, the interface between, or the, um, the net exports from MISO to PJM to swing all the way to seven, 17 gigawatts of MISO exporting power to its neighbors in PJM, which also then wield power over to CERC and, and NISO. And we do not see that dynamic if we go back to the 2024 system uh, where we see just much more stable operation, uh, not a ton of changes in, in that interface. Um, not quite as major of swings in the 2008 case, but there still is transmission being used to utilize diverse resources across the interconnection uh, during, uh, during this more mild cold wave. Um, it not only enabled whatever wind there was available to be shared across the interconnection, but also um, the remaining thermal fleet uh, to be utilized uh, more efficiently. And so they're uh, not requiring um, uh, to, ha to have an overly, an overbuilt system. Uh, so a few other notes about cold wave here that we investigated. We did look at uh, the icing and cold temperature shutdowns uh, from of wind turbines. Um, overall, if we look at conus wide, um, it probably won't come as a as a uh, uh, that big of a surprise. But um, uh, wind generation, or sorry, uh, blade icing and cold temperature shutdowns only ever accounted for no more than 10% of a D rate in wind generation if you looked over that broad area. Obviously, if you look at more localized where some of these storms are happening, the impact could be much greater, uh, focusing on, on the left-hand side of, uh, of Minnesota and Wisconsin um, during the February uh, 2011 event. Um, 
we did see periods of a 75% reduction in the available wind generation as, as shown in the, the red areas on that plot are, are periods where the, the aggregate wind fleet was being impacted by icing or cold temperatures. Um, and then finally, I mentioned this already, um, but we did also capture the impact of, of, uh, of thermal outages due to cold temperature. So that is also embedded in um, whether there was uh, thermal reserves available in MISO or SPP, as I mentioned earlier in that February 2008 cold wave. Um, and then also uh, impact to the system in, in, the, uh, in the more extreme cold wave. Oop, that just got screwed up. Um, so maybe just a, a few summaries and, and next steps um, that I wanted to highlight. So for cold waves, as I mentioned, uh, the spatial and temporal extent of the wind lull that follows that initial front is really what uh, we should be concerned of from a, a planning and operations of the system. Um, and then the sub bullet is probably going to get me in trouble with a lot of people in the room. Um, but my argument is that operational Cast understand this uh, quite well, and that's because of the efforts that have, have gone on with the people in this room. But really, the question is, do resource adequacy studies understand this? And I think that that's where our, our, our planning studies need to better understand how to use this data um, to make sure that we're, we're planning the system <coughs> um, uh, for these types of events. Uh, from our limited sample size, it does look like milder events, whether that's cold or heat um, uh, based. Um, tend to be more concerning. Now, I, I, I want to emphasize that we have been looking at a limited data set, and that, that's really what I want um, uh, next is to have a, a much larger decadal scale uh, data set to look at to see if that holds true. Um, and as we, we mentioned, transmission is operated much differently. Again, this was a study that didn't have large uh, contribution from uh, storage resources. Uh, that would be another next step is to better understand how transmission and storage might be operated it might provide similar services, but operated differently uh, 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 during these types of events in the future. So next steps, increase the wind, solar, hydro, and load data sets. And I'll, I'll pause on load briefly. We did not focus much on high electrification futures uh, in this study. And um, I never wanna look at a low electrification future again in any of these, because it just, it, the, the impact that that could have on the way that you'd operate through these events um, uh, is going to be incredibly influential. Um, and uh, um, sensitive to that. Um, so this, to, to me, this is both um, uh, looking farther back in the historical record, because I still think that there's, uh, there's uh, useful information we can learn from that, given the uncertainties uh, that we, we talked about in the last panel um, about how climate change is gonna impact the resource, but certainly also any way that we can start to incorporate impacts to the resource from from climate change uh, uh, we should for, for these types of resource adequacy um, conversations. And finally, um, uh, what, I, what I would really like to do next is not only is to better merge operational and resource adequacy modeling, um, use resource adequacy modeling to identify um, these events in these decadal long resource uh, data sets and then drive, uh, dive into them in more detail with the operational um, uh, uh, models, uh, in this case, we use production costs, but then also go uh, deeper than that and, and uh, connect uh, production costs with, with more powerful information seeded by the, the weather of, of this particular, of these different events. So that, uh, thank you for your time and I'm looking forward to the conversation later in the panel. All right, thanks, Josh. Uh, really cool study. Um, so our next speaker, you, you've heard the British guy asking questions the last few days. Now he's going to present uh, Justin Sharp from Sharply Focused. Um, give some thoughts on, on this extreme weather issue. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Is that too loud or is it, is it good? It's good, okay. All right, so um, I'm going to follow on from um, basically where Josh finished up, which was that, you know, to do these studies properly and to do a lot of the planning that we need to do in the future, we're going to need better data sets. And so um, I'm um, working with ESIG right now to, um, on, a, on a task force that is looking to um, figure out the kind of data sets that we need and the kind of methodologies we need to be able to account for these extreme events and the weather inputs that we're going to need for uh, power systems analysis going forward into the future. So um, I've used this slide quite a lot in the past. Um, basically, we're moving from a fossil fuel driven system. Um, we're halfway there towards a, a, a renewable system, which is weather driven. Um, 
And we need as many people in this room as possible to act as the bridge to be able to do that. And what I mean by the bridge is being able to communicate um, as atmospheric scientists with power system engineers and as power system engineers with atmospheric sciences, scientists. It's really important that we should have some cross-pollination and truly have a good understanding of, of both of these things um, because really this has become a, a truly cross-disciplinary um, sector. Anyway, I have this long held opinion um, that I shared with Mark Olstrom probably back in 2008, that shoehorning renewables into an existing system just si simply won't work. And we need to radically change that system. And that change needs to be informed by uh, some of the things we need to start thinking about. Um, all of the things that are now driving the system, um, a, a lot of those things are now, are now related to weather and they're correlated with one another. So as Josh was just showing, when we get a cold wave, that cold wave has typically driven load in the past. And so we've sort of thought of it as a one dimensional kind of system. And now we're moving towards a system where um, when we have a cold wave, it's driven, it's, it's driving load up, but it's also driving wind power up. And so um, that excursion is less of an issue. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So anyways, um, really quickly, the system on the left is kind of what we have today. It's weather modulated in its load and generation. It's largely thermal, it's dispatchable, centralized, um, lots of inertia. Moving over to a system that is mostly weather driven, strong correlations between that weather and the generation, as I just mentioned. And uh, while the weather modulates the load, it's now driving the resources. Uh, we've got a lot more storage, less inertia, faster ramp rates, more distributed. And ultimately the gas use will depend upon the effective planning of weather-driven resources and storage. And that's why this is really important because if we wanna decarbonize the system, we're gonna to have to do it smartly because as Josh just showed, you're not gonna cover those periods with lithium ion batteries. If people think that we're going to, you're sadly mistaken because it's not, I mean, long-term storage perhaps, but we're not there yet. Um, so this is sort of just another look at the same thing. Um, so I won't belabor it, but we're, we're basically moving to a system that's weather driven. A um, few comments about that system and how radically it's changing. The loads are going to evolve very dramatically with deep decarbonization. The economics and, the, and policy are driving that ever larger renewable energy share, which is great um, because we need to do that to mitigate climate change. And uh, that's just a reference to the paper that Josh has just presented. Um, their future resources and their contribution um, and their mix is uncertain. And a lot of the reason for that is that we don't know how future technology is gonna change as Laurent mentioned in the last session. You know, for example, how cheap will solar become? How long, uh, will long, longer duration storage become viable? Is there the political will to deeply decarbonize? These are all questions that will change the end result of the energy transition significantly. But what we do know is we know a fair amount about the weather and the climate. And so we've got to enable better decision-making, um, especially on the planning horizons with the variables that we know a lot about. Now we know a lot about weather, but the problem is we don't have very good data sets. Um, so we need to work together, as I, as I said, to build better models and we need to procure and create the right data. Um, and then we used to need to use that knowledge to um, adapt and expand the transmission grid, which is crucially important, and then strategically place our generation to minimize risk. So these are some of the ways that weather interacts um, with the system. So basically what, what you got here is some, some primary variables, aerosols, insulation, clouds, precipitation, groundwater, snow, temperature, humidity, pressure, wind, um, and the ways that they interact with the system of the future. And the uh, blue lines here basically um, represent a dependency between the system and um, uh, between the climate system and the electric system and um, where there's a dashed line uh, uh, the dashed blue lines with the thicker line in the middle indicate where that dependency strength is highly variable depending on the asset location and the type and um, each one of those variables is also internally correlated with one another so as we mentioned before when we get a cold wave we also get a lot of wind you have to transport that cold air to where it's going um, so there's the internal dependencies. And then the red lines are actually dependencies where generally they're not particularly important, but sometimes they become really important. So during a 
during a heat wave, we get to a point where we get thermal derates because our cooling water is too warm, for instance. So as you can see, it's an immensely complicated system, way more complicated than we previously had when we were just thinking about how temperature drove a peak load hour. Now you've got peak load days, peak net load days, you can have peak net load weeks. Um, so what do we need to be able to model that? Well, basically we need to um, have data which is at a spatial and temporal scale that is relevant to the system that's being modeled. Um, we need to accurately capture the resource drivers and their variability. We need to capture the uncertainty of forecasts and resource drivers. And um, we need to do the same for, for the load. And the picture I have on the, on the right here is actually taken from today. Um, it's the Bay Area. So um, San Francisco Bay is right here. Um, and this is from the GFS um, from this morning. And you can see that uh, it's, it's a pretty warm day um, in the Bay Area. This is another view of it using the um, higher resolution North American mesoscale model. And you can see that San Francisco itself is quite a bit cooler um, in this prediction, which is for right about now. Um, and that there's a fair amount more wind. Um, and then here's the view from the high resolution rapid refresh, where you can see that there's been a marine push into the San Francisco area. There's hundreds of thousands of people live there. That's a lot of load. There's a lot of difference between those, those three model results that I showed there. And this is why the resolution of the models that we're looking at and having concurrent data sets is really important because one thing drives another, that it's all interconnected. Um, so you need to have that physical consistency and concurrency with all the variables representing the same time and being dynamically consistent. Um, and uh, you know, the importance of what, I, what I've just shown on the right-hand side it may not be important in every application, but it's, it's pretty important if you're trying to get the tails, right? If you're, if you're looking at, at the, uh, the heat event that also has poor resources and you wanna to get to that, that period where, where does the system break? Where do I run out of reserve? Um, so, and then we need to provide a representative time interval and, te and uh, temporal consistency of the biases throughout the time period. So if we have, one of the suggestions that's been made is we could use the high resolution rapid refresh data as our data set um, for looking at these type of events going forward into the future. And I think that's possibly a good solution. The problem with that is it's an operational model and it's being updated on a regular basis. By updated, I don't mean rerun. I mean, the actual model is changing. So it's not consistent. So the data that I'm looking at from 2015 is from a different model to, the, to, to what I'm looking at from 2020. And then we need to be able to represent a non-stationary climate system as well. And I put that in parentheses because that is such a complicated problem as we saw in the last session. I think it's important. I don't wanna dismiss its importance, but what I'd like to see is, is actually have decent data of today and the past, which we don't even have yet. Um, so what are the, the main um, concurrent components that we need? We need a database of renewable resources, the wind and the solar, um, that can be considered as truth. And we have that today in the form of the wind toolkit and in the form of several other data sets. The problem with them is, is that they tend to just represent a short period. And as we saw with uh, Winter Storm Uri, you can't capture um, events that are, 100 year events with a seven year data set. Um, and URI had happened before. Everybody said it was unprecedented, but I, I did a presentation in this conference actually last year that showed that you, the, the kind of event that URI was has happened before and it's been worse. Um, and then you need a, a, ideally, you need a resource forecast data set too, so that when you're doing these planning studies, you can actually account for how well you can predict in the operational phase. How, um, how your resources are gonna behave together and, and dance together so that you can do effective unit commitment. And then you need to do the same with the loads and the load forecasts. And loads are a huge issue right now, uh, as Josh just mentioned. Um, 
because we, we need some way to be able to um, look at what, to figure out how to scale our loads, which um, to the future system with high electrification, um, which means having a really good temperature data set specifically. Um, and then of course we need um, hydrological data and we need some way to assess the common mode outages because that's going to become an increasingly big impact going forward into the future is these events where you've, for instance, where you've got a cold event that's impacting um, your uh, gas generation and your wind generation and your solar generation. So for instance, during the cold events that Josh was just talking about, one of the things I'm really concerned about and I have seen happen is the cold event comes through. This actually happened somewhat in Uri. Um, and then departs off to the east, the region stays really cold still because it's under snowpack and it's radiating heat like crazy at night, but it's starting, the, the air temperatures are starting to modify so the loads aren't quite as high, but then you get warm, moist air coming in off the Gulf, which comes over that snowpack and forms fog. Now you've lost your wind and you've lost your solar and you've still got high loads and that could last days. Um, so uh, what are we currently using? I just want to kind of go through some, how we're currently doing this. And it's good that this talk came right after Josh's. Uh, we, you know, we used the uh, wind toolkit and NSRDB um, for our study. One of the things that I should mention about that study is that NSRDB and the wind toolkit, they, they're, at, they're from the same time period, but they're not dynamically consistent. They're from different data sets. So just because, as I just showed on the, on the model results there, those on the, the models for today for San Francisco, that's three different models from different sources. So they're not consistent and concurrent with one another. And to be able to model the edges and get the tails, they have to be consistent and concurrent. A lot of people are using era five now, which is useful, um, but it's not sufficient resolution to resolve topography. Um, that drives the wind and the clouds in the west. And um, it's also not sufficient resolution to resolve um, clouds um, and uh, some of the convective stuff that Sue mentioned um, earlier, which is a problem on the east, on the east of the Rockies too. Um, and then one, another solution has been to use the high resolution rapid refresh, which I, I think is something that vibrant clean energy um, uses quite a lot. Um, but again, that's not a stationary model. It's changing in time. It's an operational model. It also doesn't include all of the data. Um, it's a forecast model. So it doesn't include all data that is available to create that data set. And then the last method is to use observational data, which is what's largely used today. Um, it's most commonly used by professional consultancies that are doing um, studies for utilities and RTOs. And I've uh, recently um, been on the other side of critiquing some of those studies, and I've encountered some really shockingly bad methodologies um, for filling in data. And I, I want to kind of just do a thought experiment and give a fun example of, of how data could be used or misused. So let's say I've, I'm doing a resource adequacy study for a utility. Utility comes to me and says, here's a bunch of low data, wind data, and solar data for my study. And as a consultant, I say, that's great, but it's not coincident and it's not long enough. You've only given me seven years of wind data, four years of solar data, 12 years of load, all from different years. And so I have all this data available to me right now from solar project, from, from the NSRDB, from the wind toolkit, et cetera. So what do I do? And so my client says, I don't know. And so um, I go and engage my, um, sharp engineer and see if uh, he can figure it out. So asking Ted, uh, can you clean, clean this up and fill in my data? Um, you know, I, you know, the, the, the PUC is now like in these 30 year studies and Ted says, well, let me think about it, but I really hate that wind toolkit data. It seems to have terrible bias. I hear this all the time. Um, and since I've got actual wind data, um, I'll work with that instead of using the wind toolkit, which I know there's problems with, um, and I'll synthesize the load from the temperatures like I normally do. And so he has a think about it and he comes back and he says, I got 30 years of temperature data that I've cleaned up from some real observations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find temperatures that match around the same day and year, 
and that will be a similar day. So if my temperature is the same, my wind and the solar should look pretty similar, right? Because like, you know, it's kind of a similar type of day. And that's how it's being done today. That is literally how it's often being done. Um, and then uh, we can just use the same wind and the solar shape from the match. And so I ask, will that work? And my consultant says, sure, of course it will pass. And past clients have been really pleased that we've created longer data sets. Um, so I'll get to work and then you get the study results and you present them to the client and the client says, well done, and we're off to the races. And then a meteorologist takes a look at it and his head explodes. <laughs> But in fairness to these consultancies, what are they supposed to do? They don't have the data available to do the job that they need that, that's needed, and nobody's providing the needed the, the education on the limitations of the data sets that are out there today. So what I think the solution is is we need to educate and educate again and cross-pollinate as much as we can and validate, validate, validate. And I don't mean educate like I educate the engineers in the room. I mean, we educate each other, truly a cross-pollination um, process. And then the other part is the validate, right? This wind toolkit that's out there, Pas Pascal's company actually created that wind toolkit. He won't, I'm almost certain he won't mind me saying this. There are fairly significant issues with that data set that people don't realize are there. And they're there because there's significant limitations with numerical weather prediction models. So I've got just one example here. This is the bias from the wind toolkit um, uh, generation um, relative to actual Bonneville Power um, Administration generation. So I pulled the data from Bonneville Power from, that, from their website, and then I figured out uh, how much power would be generated um, using the wind toolkit data. And this is the bias that I found. So in wintertime, the wind toolkit has a really high bias and in the summertime it has a low bias. And on some days I found that the wind toolkit data was producing up to six to eight times as much power as where it was actually there in reality. Now imagine I'm doing a resource adequacy study and I think that I've got a 24% capacity factor in the Bonneville area and the reality is it's 2%. That makes my study completely invalid. And that is the reality of where we are today. And the reason for that is that numerical weather prediction models do a very poor job with a stable boundary layer, which is an event where there's really cold air in the Columbia Basin, for instance. And so that prevents the uh, wind from storm systems that are coming over the top from mixing down to the surface. And the numerical weather prediction models tend to mix that inversion out really quickly. And so they're producing a lot more wind than is actually occurring in reality. It's a known problem, but we need to make sure that people understand that and understand these limitations. In addition, the problem has been not fixed, but it's been improved as a result of the wind, for, wind uh, forecast improvement project, which is why we need to refresh these data sets on a regular basis and why the wind toolkit is now essentially out of date. Um, two minutes left. So, um, Quick summary of the current practices. They're archaic, simplistic, and often flat out scientific, unscientific. They're poorly, poorly, quality, poor, poorly quality controlled observational data has been used as a black box. And also the model data has been used as a black box. Um, and then these, these data sets that are available have a number of issues. I don't think we'll ever get rid of the issues, but it's important that we understand what the issues are so we can contextualize. And that's what I mean by having this truly um, cross-disciplinary view. If we just use things in a black box without understanding what we're using, we could get into, really bad, uh, into a really bad situation and make bad policy decisions. Um, so I wanna say a little bit more about resolution just to kind of bang this point home. So MIRA and MIRA2 were used for quite a while for resource assessments, especially for long-term variability adjustments. And they're also used in some power systems analysis. They have a lot of shortcomings. This is a picture actually from, of, of the wind field in the Columbia Gorge where there's about five gigawatts of wind. And the points here are the grid points that MIRA data is available on, um, at the blue points. Each of those wind points is a point from a high resolution model that um, we ran at uh, Iberdrola Renewables when I worked there. Um, and so 
you can see there's a lot of structure in between those grid points. And the model just simply can't pick up that structure. So you're not going to capture that with that resolution of data sets. So, you know, what Josh and I had a discussion about this earlier today. One of one of the issues that that I that I have is that it's a chicken and egg problem because you could say, well, I, I can figure out where my when what days my problems might occur on, and then I'll zoom in on those and try and do them at high resolution so that I can do a good analysis. But the problem is that you can't figure out what days have the problems unless you do them at high, high enough resolution. Um, but fortunately, it's been replaced by ERA 5 largely now. But ERA 5, which comes from the European Center, is also at 32, about 30 to 32 kilometers, depending where you are on the planet. And the red dots here are the uh, uh, ERA 5. So you can see that they're still not even close to resolving the complexity of the wind field. So one of the questions that I have, which I don't know the answer to, is can we use machine learning techniques to downscale this data so that we don't have to have the heavy lift of the compute? But the point that I'd like to make, because I'd like to re-echo what Sarah said earlier, is the amount of money it takes to do this is trivial compared with what we're spending. I just can't believe that we're not creating these data sets. Um, so this is another example that I wanted to show, which is what is a genuinely extreme event on, for a number of reasons. September the 8th, 2020. Um, anybody who's from the Northwest will know what happened um, around this time. So the um, image on the, uh, sorry, I'm almost out of time, so I'll run through it quickly. Um, the image that's on the left-hand side is actually taken from the NSRDB data set, um, the wind component of that. And um, I, I should acknowledge that I got this data from Elaine Hart, um, who I'm working with on, on another project right now, um, where they're doing a, a west-wide resource study with this type of data. And so the dark areas show where there are high wind speeds. The other data is from the University of Washington's uh, WARF model, operational WARF model that they run every day that's showing wind speed. It's on a different scale and a different projection. So it's hard to make the exact uh, comparison, but you can see that they're basically the same. Um, they appear to be largely the same, but there's an area right here where it seems a lot windier in this model than it does from this model. And um, I want to zoom in on that region because it's pretty important. So this is where I live. Um, and you can see that there's basically no wind in the Willamette Valley here at all on, from, the, uh, from the data from Wind Toolkit, which by the way, comes from the mirror um, reanalysis. Um, and then this is a 1.33 kilometer resolution run from the University of Washington for the same time. And this area right here in the Lee of Mount Hood, there are 100 mile an hour winds here on this day. And there's a bunch of fires getting going. And this was the day when we had the enormous firestorm in the Pacific Northwest, where we ended up with the worst air pollution in the entire world for over a week. Um, it, and they just exploded in this dry air. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this event is that Elaine's identified that at the same time, there was a resource adequacy issue in the West. The, based on the capacity that we have right now, there wouldn't have been enough wind and solar um, to, to cover load on this particular day because it was hot as well. And then on top of that, because of all these fires, you've got smoke, right? So this is a tail event that you will not be able to identify with current current data sets that could be very severe. Um, so what are we going to do? So um, ESIG um, approached me last year to um, help sort of put together a task force to look at what kind of uh, practices we need to do weather modeling, um, which is kind of what I've been talking about today. And so this is my sort of little flyer, which I'm going to leave up at the end, but I've got one more slide which um, basically talks about the initial focus, which is to define the requirements for an ideal data set um, and to, to go to do this cross-disciplinary process and, and, and get input from the people who are gonna use the data, um, figure out what the most important variables are, what scale they're gonna be on, um, what methods we can use to, to gather and synthesize that data. And importantly, how are we going to validate this so that we can understand where, you know, where some of the issues are. There's some promising starting points. Um, Sue talked about the CONUS 404. 
which is a good data set. Um, NREL is currently extended in the Win Toolkit, but none of these providers with an ongoing marching forward in time data set that we can use to assess what are my climate trends and, um, and providers with a long time series that is representative of the climate that we're in currently. I don't think there's any point in going back 50 years because I don't think the climate that we're in today is necessarily representative. But what we could do is go back 10 years and then start marching forward in time and then we'll have a really, a really high quality data set from which we can start to see some of these trends. But in addition to that, we're gonna to have to somehow figure out how we're gonna do the, the, the climate side. So I'll leave it at that and I'll leave this up and hand it off to the next person. Thanks, Justin. So people can still get engaged yeah. in this. Hey, Richard. Justin, right? Yes. People can still get engaged in this if they wanna email yeah, you the members right now but um, i'm happy to manage all input from everyone all right so uh That's final speaker on the panel is uh richard tabers from tabers karamanis rokovich and he's going to uh, talk about some of the stuff they've been doing around this topic i don't know this could be <clears throat> quite a challenge to follow the two speakers that have gone ahead of me here but we're we're going to try and see see if i can do it um I think what I'd like to do is simply start out with a comment that says that the, you know, the frequency and cost of billion dollar weather events has been increasing dramatically uh, since the 1980s and 90s. And I think, um, you know, if you look at, look at those values, what you can see is that from, from the perspective of, of the power industry and from the perspective of society in general, we're looking at, at changes. I'm not saying that this is necessarily to do with climate change entirely. It clearly is in part, but if you think about it, it's also the fact that our population has gone up. Uh, where the population lives now is highly, highly concentrated day on day. And the result is that, that when we look at the problem, the problem is a weather related problem, that's for sure, but we've created it a little bit because of climate maybe, probably, definitely but significantly because of the restructuring of the way in which the, the economy has grown in the, since 1980 to, to 2020. And so you look at those numbers and they're, they're shocking. But what's more shocking, I think, is when you look at, at, that, at what we've now kind of looked at and said, we think this is in part at least done by climate change, is you look at the, at the average numbers in terms of these $1 billion plus events, and they've gone from you know, the, the 2.9 that I showed up, 2.9 per year in the 1980s, <clears throat> excuse me, up, up to the fact that you know, currently we're looking at anywhere from sort of 100, roughly $150 billion a year over the last five years. So you know, you're kind of looking and saying, okay, we've, we're now see it, but what are we, you know, what, what's the importance to it for us as a society, but what's important to it also to us also from the perspective of the power industry as we as we kind of look at how to plan for these magic words of resilience uh, and reliability in the industry uh, as a whole. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a different thought process as to how uh, my team, my teams, plural have looked at this problem and see if I can kind of give it a, a little bit of a different flavor. We work, and I'm gonna say more about this later in the talk, but we work with, with um, IBM, the weather company. And one of the interesting things about working with IBM is that, that um, they've actually spent a tremendous amount of time, effort, and money trying to kind of take weather science forward uh, mathematically, if you will, into a, into a range whereby they can get a probability distribution. And just so you, and you can laugh at this one because the guys at IBM do as well, but they, they start weather forecasting out 17 days in advance of the day. So if you'd like to know what the weather forecast is set going to be for this piece of geography, 17 days from now, they'll give it to you. Unfortunately, it has no meaning probably until we get to about five days, but, but they'll, still, they'll still, still give it to us anyway. 
This is a graph that I put in. Um, let me see if I can make this work correctly. This is the is the, the stream of temperature forecasts uh, that IBM uh, came up come came up with for Austin, Texas, starting uh, seven days before um, the coldest days down down here. And it has one interesting characteristic that I'll pick up on it. And that is, if you look back here, now we're forecasting for days out in this, out here, so I don't get Josh's head. Um, we're looking at, at taking this forecast forward and looking at the, at the spread from the five to the 95% range. And you can see we step it forward as we're going here. What's interesting is that, and I'll say more about the way in which they spread the spread out the the expectation of the five and the ninety five percent of this to get the tails. We can see is what we what we saw was that this is the actual temperature for each of these days as we were walking out through that time period, and we'll look at it. And you say now, how many people were looking at it in Texas and saying, well, let's see the mean is up here. On the other hand, we have a 5% probability that it's going to be that the problem is going to be down here. And the question is, okay, this is now for us, uh, you know, uh, a critical and extreme condition. How many of the folks involved in all of this said, well, you know, maybe I ought to be tracking this 2% and asking what would I do given that I had 2% knowledge under these circumstances? If that's correct, day one and day two and day three and day four and day five. Maybe our mean value and our forecasts aren't very good, but if I'm looking at the distribution, I'm seeing, yep, I'm inside the distribution, but I'm, at, I'm, I'm seeing that I'm gonna have a, a, a likely uh, very, very, very cold event coming up under these circumstances. So that's just to kind of get us started here. We did, we've done more work looking at that same time period for Jackson, Mississippi, and you'll see what's happening here for Jackson, same story. But what's interesting is that the, the height of the spread, you know, when you see weather forecasts that say my probability distribution between the 5% level and the 95% level stretches over this many degrees. And in this case, we're looking at a 25 degree spread uh, could be as low as this, could be as high as this, with 25 degrees along along the way. That's the cold end. We looked at the warm end in the, in uh, MISO again. This is Miss Minneapolis, and this is for. Um, let me get the date on this one, but I think I think this is for June of this year. Um, and you can see again here. Here's the spread. Where are we? We're sitting at the top virtually sitting at the top of the spread over the June, June time period. It's 2021, sorry, not 2022, obviously, because we haven't gotten out quite this far in June, um, but, but uh, minor, minor consideration. So essentially what we've been trying to do is to understand uh, how one learns from, takes information from four or five or six days, which we're comfortable with, ahead of the day of expectation or the day of delivery and, and to take the information that we get from the spread of the weather forecast, right? Uh, to, to be able to use that to help uh, understand resource availability or resource inadequacy. Uh, in other words, the, the, the ability to either have enough or not to have enough. What's the probability of not having enough resources available in a particular hour of a day, four days, three days, two days, one day uh, ahead of the, of the actual day. What are we doing and how and why? Well, it turned out that, and this is kind of a, an interesting story that of, of, of the way things go together, but my business partner, Alex Rudkovich, who's responsible for analytics and so on on the display out here. About now 11 years ago, along with a couple of other Russian mathematical geniuses, came up with the mathematics that said, 
you know, we have the ability to calculate nodally uh, what the resource availability is nodally with this modeling system. However, there was nothing to drive it. In other words, we didn't have anything that we had any confidence in the stochastic spread that we could say, okay, now with this, with this, uh, if if we had this, this would be this would be perfect. We could, but but the math works. Over over an argument with someone who turned out to be a good friend of mine, uh, over exactly what the weather company did and how it got its data, turned out we discovered that IBM and and others who were in the front edge of of weather science had discovered a methodology for combining um, combining the uh, world weather models uh, to create a probabilistic weather forecast. And so what IBM does basically at this point, and I'm saying IBM only because that's the one I work with, not because there's anything God given about IBM, but the weather company basically runs 87 different numerical weather models uh, and ensemble monitor and on, <laughs> excuse me, ensemble members to be able to come up with a set of forecasts. And what they do under these circumstances is they correct the, they correct the ensemble members uh, to take care of the fact that there aren't that the tails are, are too short. Then they rearrange all of the values into a rank ordering structure to create 100 synthetic weather system scenarios. And the key to this is that the 100 weather system scenarios are all uh, independent and they go from a probability of basically one chance in 100 to a probability of 99 or 100% chance in 100. And so I've got a perfect, kind of a perfect stream of, of probabilistic forecast that I can use now to drive, if you will, my models and Alex's models of, of, uh, of, of the stochastic behavior of the system by looking at wind, solar, and load as though those were driven by, um, by, by, in fact, the weather forecast. And so the probabilistic forecasts are, are, are created uh, on demand, quotation marks, by IBM on an hourly time step. And this says 15 days in advance, we don't pay attention to 15, um, but we are very interested in following it for the five days under a project we have with the ARPA, ARPA E research offer, operation. And we use, these, uh, we use these forecasts then, and we pick them up now uh, for every day. We go in and pick up a day's worth, and we're picking up 24 hours for five days in advance. And we have each of the weather variables that we're picking up. So whatever IBM is using in terms of temperature, uh, on a, by the way, four by four kilometer basis, temperature, humidity, dew slash dew point, wind speed, and so on, we're able to, to collect and keep, and then use to, to forecast looking forward uh, what, that, what the weather is and therefore what the output of the, uh, what the output is, is from weather to energy. So I'm going to talk for a minute now about the ARPA pro, ARPA E project that we have, which is is SNAP. Again, someone more clever than me came up with a title on it, but this is stochastic nodal adequacy platform or pricing, and what it does is it allows us to combine the best of weather science as we've been able to find out, which is the work of the of the, of the IBM folks who are part of the project, not simply giving us the data. They're, they're an active part of the project. So we combine the weather science with power systems engineering and economics, uh, and then with enhanced optimization and cloud computing. And this becomes important as you'll see down the line. And so in, in traditional resource adequacy studies, one of the issues is that those studies basically handle one uh, scenario or maybe multiple scenarios for a worst case, uh, worst case scenario for a year. 
So if you look at what MISO does at this point and some of the other ISOs, so there's, a, there's an effort to say, I'm doing my resource adequacy. I've got a couple of scenarios. I'm looking at the worst day and, and, and that's what I'm gonna plan, plan for or plan against. With SNAP, what we're trying to do is basically say, what I wanna know is, do I have enough resources, to, uh, generating resources and load resources, right? Both sides uh, that, that I can be assured that I will be able to deliver energy to, uh, to the load for our entering, pick a number, 13 tomorrow. Say, okay, that's part of it. On the other hand, the other part from SNAP is that we're actually more interested in, in, in inadequacy than adequacy. We'd like to know what's the probability of, of not having enough resources and where will that inadequacy happen within the system, i.e. What where, where in, the, in the overall nodal structure will that occur and what is occurring, uh, what, is, what, is, what is the cause and what can, we, what can we basically do about it? So if I'm looking at it, I go from traditional resource adequacy once a year, maybe a few scenarios, to the ability to actually look probabilistically now at what, uh, what would happen or could happen in the system as, as a whole. And when I say probabilistically, what I'm saying is looking at, okay, I've got this wind with a probability, wind forecast with a probability of 5%, mean 95%. So I've got a full range of wind, I have a full range of solar, and I have a full range of, of, of demand. In addition, I have the probability of forced outages of every one of my generating units as well. So you can think about that and say, this is sort of the uh, a Monte Carlo uh, problem uh, on a mix and match basis on steroids. And the answer is that is in fact what the case is. How do we get to it? Well, we have an ability to take every one of those scenarios for every hour and, and take it and run it through our analytics to create a wind, uh, a wind output. So the energy from every wind turbine that exists in, uh, in MISO. Why? Well, because we're operating on a four kilometer by four kilometer basis. Is that working perfectly? No. Why? For the same reason we've discussed We've got questions about exactly whether our coefficient that we pick up at ground level and, and uh, reinterpret at hub height level, whether that's, that's the perfect coefficient to use. But nonetheless, we've done it. We've used it, tested it. Works pretty well, actually. Um, we're doing the same thing with load. Again, taking weather and translating from weather plus all of the other variables that are generally used in forecasting of load to, to being able to come up with a stochastic look at what the probability of load is at each location for a particular hour out again, five days, four days, three days, two days, uh, and then day ahead as we go down the line. We use analytics, which is we describe outside if you wanna pick up something on it, which is a cloud-based system uh, that allows us to, to run lots of optimizations um, very efficiently the way we've, we've set it up. Um, here's the schematic that we use, which essentially is logic. You know, you start with the probabilistic weather forecast plus your external grid operations. Then you look at what you're gonna have in terms of load, wind, solar, and so on down the line. Uh, you, you're looking at what the, what the outages are probabilistically based on A to B off to here. And then, then essentially we're developing uh, using PSO, um, what the, going through a PSO cycle by cycle by cycle to look at the impact coming out at what the metrics are then for, uh, for the um, um, metrics are for reliability basically at this point. And this system is working. Um, our calculations work. We get them 
to go. So our objective function, not surprisingly, is minimize production, bid and offer cost plus the cost of unserved energy. And for this, we're using for the cost of unserved energy, various values of loss load, um, which it turns out seems to, um, is obviously more, more useful than trying to work with a loss of load probability. Why? Because loss of load probability is just an engineering value that a couple of engineers came up with in the 1940s, basically. Um, whereas what we're interested in now really is what, what's the value as, as we were looking at, remember, from the what's a billion dollar loss. So we're really interested in what the value is to all of this, this activity. Um, we're following through, looking again at how one can how one can do this much analysis under these circumstances. And not surprisingly, as I've said before, our job is to identify inadequacy, not adequacy, right? So what we're trying to provide to the operator is information that says you have an X percent probability of, have, of not having sufficient, sufficient adequacy for a specific hour upcoming. I'm going to skip over that because they're obvious. And let me just go and, and kind of give you the sort of the number numerology that, that kind of is in this. How many, sun, how many um, uh, operations, how many runs of the, of the OPF structure are we running at a time? We're looking at 100,000 scenarios per hour. So it's a relatively large number under these circumstances. And we have the ability to analyze that with, uh, with the cloud-based uh, use of the analytics system, the PSO system. And we can run uh, and do one hour's worth of analysis, the probability part of it. We can, we can run 100,000 scenarios. Um, the 100,000 scenarios are run on 500 virtual processors on the cloud. Um, uh, we get the results in 45 minutes, plus or minus a little bit, at a cost of about $120 per hour on our run, our analytic hour, which is pretty, pretty low. Our, our, uh, our, our, our estimate of precision, and I'm careful I say, our estimate of precision at this point is about 3%. So effectively what we're doing in, in kind of a summarized fashion at this point is we're really looking at being able to handle and look at long-term benefits of improved knowledge about resource adequacy, improved knowledge meaning in, in time under these circumstances with the hypothesis that says we probably have and, and are planning against having more um, megawatts of capacity available every day than is actually needed. Some days it'll be more, but there are gonna be a lot of days when it's less. And, and, and so we're really looking at on the short term, kind of reducing the cost and scheduling operating reserves uh, on a locational basis, remember again, everything in the math here that we're working on is nodal, which is all to the good. So with that, I'm gonna stop, I think I've run over my time anyway, and pass the system back over to the boss here.